So good morning to everyone. We're going to continue with the uh, Pareto Archive Evolution Strategy. Th this is actually a, a very interesting algorithm. It was developed by this guy, Joshua Knowles. Uh, David Korn was his advisor in, uh, in UK at the University of Reading. And, and it's a very interesting algorithm because it's probably the simplest multi-objective evolutionary algorithm that could be designed. So it's only what we call a one plus one evolution strategy. That means we have a single solution. This solution is mutated. This mutation is called the, the child of, of this solution. And we compare the parent with the child. Whoever has uh, a better value is the one that we keep. In this case, it's check for dominance. So if the offspring dominates its parent, then we keep the offspring, and, uh, and this offspring becomes the parent for the following generation. So it, from the perspective of the, uh, the way it operates is very simple, but the interesting component of this algorithm is the external archive. The external archive uses a density estimator that is called the adapted grid. And it works like this. This is objective function space, so this will be objective function one, objective function two. So the only parameter for this is the number of subdivisions we have in this grid. The values for F1 and F2 are the maximum values that have been found so far. So for example, if for objective one, the maximum value I found is 200, this will be 200, and for F, F2 is 500, is 500. So we do the subdivisions. So all the solutions that are non-dominated will enter the archive. But at the beginning, of course, the archive is empty. Over time, you will have several solutions like this. And they are distributed according to the grid. So there is a bound on, on how many solutions we can put in the archive. For example, 100. Once we reach the bound, if there is a new solution that should be stored, but we don't have any room for this solution, so we check in which of these squares uh, we will uh, locate the, the solution. So if it's not in the grid that has the highest number of solutions, in this case is this one that has three solutions, if, that, if the new solution will fit anywhere else except for this, for this square, then we go to the one with the highest number of solutions. We randomly delete one of them, for example, E, and we allow the new solution to enter, for example, in here. So this allows a, a, a distribution towards regions of objective function space in which we don't have enough solutions. It's, it's a very nice idea. The implementation is, is not that easy. It's, it's a bit complicated. And there is another problem that Although this algorithm is very efficient for uh, two objectives, it cannot be generalized. It's probably possible to make it work with three objectives, but more than three is not possible. So that's, that's a serious limitation. But in that time, you know, it was a, a very nice idea back in the year 2000. That was 18 years ago. It was not that popular, but a few people used this, including Joshua. Joshua had a, he was participating in a project with British Telecom in, in UK, and they used this algorithm in, in some telecommunications problems. Over the years, a few other people used the algorithm, for example, in scheduling, and there were a few other applications. Then this is David Korn. He, this guy was the advisor of, of Joshua Knowles. He, he developed another algorithm in 2001 that uh, was called the Pareto Envelope-Based Selection Algorithm. This, this algorithm is, is kind of, a, we can say it's a variation of the Pareto Archive. But instead of having only one solution at a time, it uses a population. It's just the population size is very small, uh, perhaps 10 individuals, no more than 30 individuals. It's, it's a very small population. It still uses the external archive, same as the Pareto Archive. And it gives this hypergrid uh, division of objective function space. That's the square, the rectangles. Uh, but in this case, 
instead of counting how many solutions he has in one square to see if the new solution will, will enter, he uses a crowding measure very similar to NSGA2. So he sort of uses the same uh, density estimator, but in this case, he's applied directly on the grid, on each of the rectangles. So it's, it's not a very novel algorithm, but uh, there was even a second version of this algorithm. It was published also in the year 2001. It's sort of an improvement. Uh, and this one, it takes the same concept to an extreme, because in this case, uh, he assigns fitness values to the, to the rectangles, to the hyperboxes, and, and this, uh, uh, the selection mechanism is based on hyperboxes. So you decide which of the boxes is the best, and also which solution inside that box is, is the best. So he, uh, David Korn argues that this is a more efficient way of doing this, but again, this sort of approach cannot be generalized. The three algorithms have the exact same limitation, which is dimensionality. They cannot be used with more than two objectives. And uh, the, the Pareto envelope uh, selection algorithm was used only with a few problems uh, that David Korn had at that time. I, I don't believe that many people use this algorithm besides uh, David Korn himself. However, something interesting is this algorithm is available in, uh, in most of the libraries that implement multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. For example, PISA has it, same as, uh, as J-Metal. They have the algorithm. Then we have the micro-genetic algorithm. This is the guy I, I, I told you about yesterday, Gregorio. He, he was my PhD student several years ago. He was also my master's student. And when he, uh, when he was my master's student, I, I told him once, about this concept, is, this is so actually a, a, a very interesting concept from the, uh, I think it's the late 80s. Uh, David Goldberg wrote a paper once in which he claimed that any problem, any optimization problem could be solved with a genetic algorithm having a very small population size. And he called this concept the concept of a micro-genetic algorithm. He claimed that no more than five individuals were necessary. But he said, well, you know, if you run the genetic algorithm with a very s a small population size, what happens is very soon all the solutions will be identical. So you have to reinitialize the population, delete four solutions, keep only one, uh, you, you generate randomly again the other four, and you keep doing this until there is no improvement anymore. It was kind of a very simple concept, a, a little bit intriguing, not many people have used this, this sort of algorithm, but I thought it was an interesting idea. So I mentioned this in a, in a course I taught in, back in the year 2000. Uh, and this guy who was my master's student, he approached me and he said that as his uh, project for my course, he, he wanted to implement this algorithm. And I thought he would not be able to do it, but, but I was, of course, wrong because he, he was able to do it. Let me see if I, yeah. Uh, you probably won't be able to see this very, very well. The image is not of a good quality. So the dotted line that you can see here, this area, is the, uh, the micro-genetic algorithm. This is basically a genetic algorithm, but with a population size of only four individuals. So at the beginning, he generates a certain number of solutions randomly, and he has these two population memories. In here, these rectangles are not, uh, uh, the, the drawing is, is not correct because it's not half and half. It's normally about 70% uh, is what we call replaceable memory, and the other 30% is the non-replaceable. So at the beginning, the two memories have only random solutions. So uh, let's assume the total is 100, so we will have 70 in the replaceable and 30 in the non-replaceable, but they are all random. Then we enter the microgenetic algorithm by taking two solutions from here and two solutions from here, two from the replaceable and two from the non-replaceable. We execute a genetic algorithm for a certain number of iterations. It's a low number, normally 10. This is what uh, we call nominal convergence. It's a concept that is used in, in microgenetic algorithms. And we stop. 
we will have at least one non-dominant solution, but if we have more than one, we randomly select one of them. This solution goes to an external memory, which is very similar to the external memory of the Pareto archive. And also, this solution will go to the replaceable memory. All we do is to look for somebody in the replaceable memory that is dominated by the solution in the external archive, and we remove the dominated solution and replace it by the new one. So, of course, over time, as we are doing this several times, the replaceable memory will contain only non-dominated solutions. However, the other one still has random solutions, so this is the source of diversity in, in a sense. So it, it looks like a very simple idea, but something very interesting is that in the uh, experimental studies we conducted at that time, back in 2001, this algorithm was one order of magnitude faster than NSGA2. And it still produced the exact same results. It, it was able to converge uh, to the same solution. So it was very interesting, however, it had one problem. The problem was the number of parameters. It, it required too many parameters. A parameters, some of these A parameters were not very intuitive, uh, and two of them were, were very important. If you didn't know how to set up these parameters, the algorithm will not work properly. So as I say yesterday, when, when we released the code, and I asked Gregorio to release the code in the public domain, I never thought anybody actually will, will use this algorithm. But I was wrong, because lots of people use the, uh, the algorithm. We had used this uh, with an application we developed back in the year 2002 when Gregorio attended a conference held at MIT. But uh, over the years, other people use this for designing supersonic business jets, for uh, uh, partitions of hardware software systems, and so on. I had a collaboration with some people from Chile who, uh, who use this algorithm for a, a power systems problem in, in the uh, central part of Chile. So it was really uh, very interesting, very exciting to see how people like this algorithm and they use this algorithm. There have been other microgenetic algorithms. This is not the only one, but this was the first, designed for multi-objective optimization. So Gregorio came to Simvestab uh, for a PhD because in, in the master's uh, he was somewhere else. I was at that place at that time outside Mexico City. He came for, uh, for the PhD with me and and he said, well, I want to develop an improved version of the microgenetic algorithm that doesn't require any parameters. And, and he called this algorithm the, the microGA2. This is actually a, a very uh, complex design, uh, which we only managed to get one publication of this in a conference, because then Gregorio abandoned the idea of, of developing this any further. But uh, this also is not very readable, but uh, it's at the beginning what it does, the algorithm uh, has a, a set of crossover operators and it adopts binary encoding and real numbers encoding. So these three boxes is because he runs three micro GAs concurrently, he uses threads in, in, a, in a computer that had several processors. And I believe two of them are using binary encoding, and the other one is using real numbers encoding in the same problem. So the first stage, he, uh, he tries to decide the encoding. Should I use binary or should I use real numbers? So there is some uh, preliminary uh, uh, run to decide this, and once he decides the encoding, then there are crossover operators associated with that encoding. So that is also decided, which crossover should I use? And, and all this initial stage is uh, exploratory. He's not aiming to converge. He's just trying to decide what combinations to use, what encoding with what crossover operators. So once the, the, the initial stage is over, in the second stage, he runs a conventional uh, microgenetic algorithm, but he has already decided all this part of the parameters and the encoding and all this. So it's, it's actually a very interesting algorithm that didn't even need a parameter to uh, stop. You, you didn't have to tell the algorithm, uh, 
run for 500 generations. The algorithm will start by itself, which make it complicated. It, it was kind of complicated to compare results with respect to, to other algorithms. But it was very interesting. However, uh, unfortunately, this algorithm, the, the source code got lost because you know, his computer got stolen or something like that. I don't remember the story of this one. But uh, it got lost forever. And, and Gregorio is, is kind of a complicated guy to explain things. He, he doesn't really know how to explain things. He's, he's a very good programmer, but not very good uh, at explaining or documenting code. So I, I had uh, a lot of trouble to, to get this paper out of his head, because uh, each time we, we sat to discuss the, the paper, I would ask him pseudocode, and he gave me pseudocode that had no use at all. You know, his pseudocode was like, begin, select, end. So this <laughs> says absolutely nothing. You know, every evolutionary algorithm does that. So, uh, and I ask him details, and I ask him details all the time. And each time I ask him, he will tell me a piece of information, but never gave me the whole thing. Although I saw the algorithm working. This I, I was able to see several times. Uh, but he also had several versions. So to be honest, I don't believe anybody sh will be able to reproduce the implementation based on this paper. That includes myself. However, there was this guy in Chile who contacted me again, the same guys from, from the original MicroGA, asking for my help because they had managed to implement the MicroGA too. I said, how did you do it? And, and of course, the implementation is wrong, but you know, it's an evolutionary algorithm, so it still works. So it's OK. You know, I, they, they ask me, is this OK? I say, well, I guess it's OK, because it's better of what I have. You know, I have nothing. I have no code. So whatever they, they got there should be OK. OK. So up to this point, these are, before we get to the recent algorithms, uh, let me talk to you uh, about all these has been like happy stories, success stories. But it's also important to know some non-success stories. Uh, for during many years, several people have developed a wide variety of algorithms. And of course, some of these algorithms were published in obscure journals, in, uh, in obscure conferences. So if that is the case, you, you cannot expect people to use these algorithms, at least not evolutionary computation people. But what about those algorithms that were published in top journals, in top conferences, and still nobody uses those algorithms. So these are the algorithms that I call the multi-objective evolutionary algorithms that the world forgot. In some cases, it's just bad luck. You know, I don't like to believe in luck, but this has to be bad luck. I have no other explanation. For example, this one, the incrementing multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. And I have to tell you, Keishin Tang is my friend, I, I was one of the reviewers of this paper. It was a very long paper. You know, double space was like 80 pages. It was like reading a thesis. Uh, and I had to read the thing like three times. So the third time I was like, you know, I will accept this no matter what, because I don't want to read this paper anymore <laughs> in my life. But the thing was, it had a few interesting ideas. For example, this dynamic population size, which is not very common to have rather than a fixed population size to, to vary the size over time. And uh, also this adapted niching, we, we talked about niching a little bit yesterday, we will talk more today. Uh, but that was about it. It was not really you know, a creative algorithm. But the reason why this algorithm didn't become uh, famous or, or popular was because by the time the, the review process took so long that by the time the paper got published in 2001, everybody was using elitist Pareto based multi objective evolutionary algorithms. And this is a non elitist multi objective evolutionary algorithm. But that was because the review process took two, two years. You know, it was bad luck. At the time the thing was written, it was still OK. It was the end of this wave but he could catch the, the, the end of the wave. But by the time it got published, nobody was interested in this algorithm. The constraint method-based evolutionary algorithm by Ranji Rangitan. This guy, well, this guy really had no harm because he's a civil engineer. He works in a civil and environmental uh, engineering department. Yes?
But uh, I, I, my, my question is like it's not uh, it's very general. And any closed form solution or any exact algorithm gives you the asymptotic for parameters as n tends to infinity or the, the sample space increases. Now for these type of algorithms which give very good results uh, considering they are very difficult to solve using any exact algorithm, like for each time we run either the parameters change, the values change. So can we find out the consistency and the unbiased form of this asymptotics to come up with some answer, is it possible? I guess it's possible, but I don't know how reliable the uh, result will be. Because what people in evolutionary computation have been trying to do is more to use the statistical tools to decide the parameter values of so an evolutionary algorithm given a a specific test problem so that we don't do it in an empirical way as we used to do 20 years ago. That you say, okay, crossover should be 0.8, uh, mutation point 0 0.01, whatever. Any values, but you modify the values and the results change a lot. So to avoid that, now people use, there are tools that have been designed to do all this statistical analysis. Of course, they are computationally expensive because you have to perform many runs. But uh, it is now possible to do it that way. The opposite way, I, I haven't seen uh, any, any warning, uh, at least not in multi object, of once you have the solution, try to do some, some sort of analysis towards that, or trying to, uh, to find like critical regions in which the algorithm is behaving well. That in general, in multi-objective at least, is, is very difficult, because we are not converging to a single value. We are converging to a set. So it would be very difficult to, to measure this unless we use a scalar measure. The reason why I'm asking is that for the last 15 years in statistics, like uh, the two top uh, journal in statistics, they have come up with their applied part. Like annals of statistics has an annals of applied statistics, annals of probability has annals of applied probability. So what they do is that in the applied part, you have a big part is theory. And then you have a data set where you try to prove the theory. So in case you are not able to get asymptotics using theoretical runs, you do some simulations, huge number of bootstrapping simulations, uh, 50,000 number of times, 60,000 number of times, and then try to find out some asymptotic values of the parameters. So I thought that maybe in this area also some progress is good. Sounds interesting. Yeah, I, I guess it's worth trying. I haven't seen any of those. Probably somebody has, has done it in, in single objective. Uh, I don't think yeah. in most objective anybody has done it. Well, it's an interesting idea. So this algorithm, the uh, CMEA, uh, was proposed uh, at the uh, first international conference on IMO, held in Zurich, in 2001. And it's, it's very interesting because this is actually a hybrid between a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm and the epsilon constraint method that we saw yesterday. So this guy uses the epsilon constraint. He estimates the nadir point. You don't have to compute the, the, the exact nadir point. And it's, a, I believe, a very nice idea. But for some reason, most people in the area didn't, didn't find it uh, exciting. Uh, the orthogonal multi-objective evolutionary algorithm, this was proposed also in a top journal, evolutionary computation. You know, in, in our area, there are now several journals, but uh, originally there were only two. Evolutionary computation is the oldest, and the IEEE transactions on evolutionary computation is, is right now the one with the highest impact factor. It's more than 10, the impact factor today. But evolutionary computation for many years was a journal with a tradition of publishing mainly theoretical papers. So evolutionary computation people will make the joke that they said, if you want your paper to get cited, you have to publish it in the transactions. But if you want to be recognized by your peers in evolutionary computation, you need to publish here. <laughs> Nobody is going to cite you ever, but they will, uh, they will see you with respect because it's, it's difficult to publish in this journal. That's no longer true, but it was true for many years because the editor-in-chief of this journal for many years was a guy who who like it only theoretical papers. But in any case, this paper made it to, to the evolutionary computation. And uh, 
And it's very strange because even I, that I have read a lot of multi-objective, was not familiar with this paper for many years. Then I read the paper, and it's very strange because this isn't, this isn't even an evolutionary algorithm. It's called uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithm, but it's based on orthogonal design. It's a deterministic method based on statistics. It's, it's not really an evolutionary algorithm, which is perhaps the reason why nobody in evolution computation uses this. But uh, if you see uh, the name, uh, it seems to imply that it is an evolutionary algorithm. Uh, this is another one very interesting. I, I met this guy many years ago, Richard Bolling. This guy was in architecture. And one day he came up with this weird idea of what he called the maximin. The maximin is similar to compromise programming. It's basically a formula. And he claimed that with this formula, you could obtain Pareto dominance and the density estimator in a single formula. And it's a very simple formula. So, you know, most people at that time, when he presented this the first time, they thought he was crazy. Uh, that includes myself. But uh, we saw the results, and the results were intriguing, because the, result, the results were not bad. They look actually quite good. But we felt something was wrong here, that something was not really uh, in place. So he presented this uh, at Gecko in 2001 in San Francisco. That's where I met Richard. Uh, and then he disappeared. After some years, a few people got interested in, in this concept of the maximum method. And I had myself a PhD student who graduated a couple of years ago who, uh, who worked on analyzing how this works. And we found some really interesting things. The maximum is, is really very similar to an indicator that is called the epsilon indicator. And we will see that in, in a couple of lectures. But uh, it produces solutions that are weakly uh, dominated. This is not uh, traditional dominance. It's weak dominance. It is possible to fix it so that it produces dominant solutions. But the intriguing thing about this is that this formula is indeed able to select solutions is very efficient and it's scalable. You can use this with any number of objectives. It's, it's very, very intriguing. It's just still, it's not popular. There was another guy, this is a guy from Mexico who studied with Goldberg, uh, Manuel Valenzuela Rendon. He, uh, he developed many years ago, back in 97, uh, what he called the non generational genetic algorithm. Uh, this is based, this is a multi objective evolutionary algorithm based on a learning classifier system. Learning classifier systems are genetic algorithms used for classification. This is basically John Holland's original idea. And, and what he did was to transform the multi objective optimization problem into a problem having two objectives. One was related to convergence, and the other one was related to diversity. And he applied what we call a non-generational genetic algorithm, which is a genetic algorithm in which there is no full replacement. You generate the solutions, and you replace one solution at a time. At each iteration, you are only replacing one. And he obtained very nice results. There was some guy uh, from Brazil who, in 2000, proposed uh, an improved version of this algorithm, and then it disappeared. No, nobody else got interested in this, in this algorithm, which I still believe is, is an interesting idea. Uh, Osixka, in, in 96, he, he proposed to use this uh, contact theorem that I mentioned yesterday to design uh, a genetic algorithm for multi-objective optimization. The contact theorem basically implies computing some Euclidean distances. The, this is uh, similar to compromise programming. And, and this worked kind of nicely, but it didn't have a density estimator. And, and again, the algorithm has never been popular. It was published in a journal back in 96, and then it disappeared. This is another interesting algorithm, the Nash genetic algorithm. Uh, this guy I, I, I know, Jack Perriot, is kind of a crazy guy. Uh, he worked in, uh, in, the, um, in, in industry in France, designing airplanes for many years. And, and he had a very uh, tight collaboration with people from Spain. So I met him in a conference in Spain some years ago, and then I saw him again uh, in 2013, I think it was. Uh, he's now retired. 
he designed a coevolutionary uh, approach in which he tries to approximate a Nash equilibrium point uh, using an evolutionary algorithm. And this algorithm produces a single solution. This doesn't produce Pareto fronts or anything like that. It produces a single solution that approximates this Nash equilibrium point. And, and he uses sort of a specialized operators, this, this distance-based mutation. And he claims that obtaining this point is, is very relevant for the sort of problems he was solving. A, a Nash equilibrium point is not the same as, as a Pareto optimal solution. Under certain conditions, they may be the same. A Nash Pareto point may be a Pareto optimal solution, but not all the time. And also, uh, these Nash points are not always uh, available, because uh, when you do it mathematically, you have to get some uh, partial derivatives. But he was happy with this algorithm, and, and I was very surprised to see in the year 2000 that uh, a former collaborator of this guy, he published a survey on the Nash genetic algorithm. See, who the hell is using this algorithm? And of course, it was only them, but, but they had several papers on this, and it got published in the year 2000. I don't think anybody else has used this, this very peculiar algorithm. Then we have the thermodynamic genetic algorithm proposed by Kita in 96. This paper is actually was highly cited for many years, but not because of the algorithm. It's because of the test problems he uses. But uh, it was an interesting algorithm in which he uses the concept of entropy and, and also uh, these ideas from simulate annealing of using a cooling schedule for the selection mechanism. It's also a very strange idea. Was published in a top conference, PPSN, which is held every two years, always in Europe. Then we have the Epsilon uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithm developed by Kalja Moideb, which is based on a relaxed form of Pareto dominance called Epsilon dominance. We will talk about this. Uh, this is kind of a, a peculiar algorithm. Also uses a steady state selection. That means you replace one solution at a time. It's the same as non-generational. Uh, and in the external population, he uses this relaxed form of uh, Pareto dominance. So it was published in evolution and computation, but nobody really paid attention to this algorithm. There were, there were other more uh, exotic ideas. For example, Allenson produced an algorithm that used genders. So two solutions to be able to recombine, they had to be of different genders. So there was male and female. So at the beginning, half of the population were created as males, the other half as females. And of course, there were rules on, on the gender of the children. You had to, to produce certain rules for that. It was kind of an intriguing idea. The algorithm was not particularly uh, complicated. And, and this was supposed to be uh, a master's project. In UK, the masters uh, are only one year. And like uh, in, in UK, it's only one year. And, and six months, you have to take courses. And the other six months is the, is the project. In US, it's uh, two years. So it's one year of courses and one year of the thesis. So this was sort of a six months uh, project. So it was very simple. Uh, it was intriguing. Of course, it has some issues. Like if you use genders, you cannot extend this to, to more than two objectives, right? That's unless you extend the genders. But uh, there was, of course, uh, some intention to do that. Um, uh, Lise and Ivan, uh, Gus Ivan is the guy in the picture, in 96, generalized this approach so that you could have as many genders as, as objectives. And it was published in a, in a specialized conference, but again, nobody really paid attention to this multisexual uh, genetic algorithm, which is, well, Gus Ivan is in the Netherlands, so it's a, it's a very uh, natural place to produce a paper with that title. So, okay. This is just a small sample. Now we will move to recent approaches, the algorithms that people are using today, what we call the state of the art. Although some of these algorithms, like this one, is not that recent. It was published in 2007. However, there are many variations of this algorithm. On this algorithm, I can tell you I, I have a, an interesting story. Uh, Xin Fu Sang is a very nice guy. He's a good friend of mine who is now in, in Hong Kong. And, uh, I told him this story several years ago. 
back in 2002, I believe, or yeah, probably 2002, I had this PhD student who, uh, who was a mathematician, very brilliant uh, lady. But, you know, mathematicians in general are difficult people. Not all of them, but most of them are very difficult to deal with. And, uh, and as an engineer, of course, my degree of difficulty was even higher. So she wanted to do the PhD with me, and her husband was also doing the PhD with me. I had no problem with the husband. And so she came to see me, and I gave her this paper on an algorithm that I read when I was a PhD student. It was called Normal Boundary Intersection. Very interesting idea. It was a PhD thesis from Rice University. And I told her, read this paper because I believe it will be possible to design a nice multi-objective evolutionary algorithm based on this idea. So she went home, came back one month later, and, well, you know, mathematicians. She, she gave me 10 reasons of why it was not worth implementing this. You know, an engineer goes, implements the thing, and says, well, it didn't work. No, a mathematician, of course, they will not get their hands dirty. Why should I implement this if in my mind I can run the thing, right? I can run the experiments in my brain. So I disagree with what she said, but I didn't want to argue. So I said, yeah, I don't care. We will do something else. So she ended up working on coevolution and fitness sharing, uh, fitness inheritance. So in the year 2009, I got invited to, to be a member of a committee in the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society to to grant the best paper award for the IEEE transactions on evolutionary computation. So I received the papers, and the first paper I read was this one from Shin Fusan. And I started reading the paper, and I said, this algorithm is based on MBI. So that was exactly the idea I had back in 2002, and that my students say it was not possible to do. But not only was possible, this gave rise to the, the algorithm that is considered right now the most popular and the most powerful we have. This is the algorithm that sort of left behind NSGA2. So what's the idea of Moia D, the multi-objective evolutionary algorithm based on decomposition? It's, it's actually a very simple idea that comes from mathematical programming. He does something that we call escalarization. It's also called decomposition. We transform the multi-objective optimization problem into several single objective optimization problems, very similar to epsilon constraint. However, in this case, he managed to use uh, something he called neighborhood search so that all the single objective optimization problems are solved simultaneously. And he does this in a very efficient way. So, there were other approaches before this one that, that had similar ideas. For example, the multi-objective genetic local search from Hisao Ichibuchi. Uh, but this worked in a different way using uh, uh, linear aggregating functions. <coughs> and of course, the idea is based on MBI, which was uh, proposed by Das in 98. And it's a very nice uh, algorithm. There have been many variations of Moia D, uh, at least 20, I believe that I know of, there are probably more. Uh, it, it's a very, very uh, powerful algorithm. Another intriguing idea, well, uh, decomposition methods are considered a family of algorithms, although most of the algorithms that have been proposed based on decomposition are just variations of Moiadi. A second family is what we call indicator-based selection. And this is a very interesting uh, idea as well. This is the, uh, the area in which I'm most interested right now, this, uh, most of my, my students are working in this area. So what is indicator-based selection? OK. In indicator-based selection, the idea is, or the question first was, is it possible to select solutions not using Pareto optimality, using something else? And at the beginning, People thought, no, it's not possible. You have to use Pareto optimality. You have to live with that. Well, guess what? It is not necessary to use Pareto optimality. You can use a performance indicator, but not any performance indicator. Only few can be used for this. This is the so-called indicator-based selection. So how is that this idea started? Well, some years ago, actually, the guy who started this was Joshua Knowles. In his PhD thesis, he, he proposes to use the hypervolume, and we will talk a lot about hypervolume, 
when we talk about the indicators, he proposed to use this performance indicator in an external archive to prune the contents of the archive. But nobody paid attention. They, they thought, OK, it's a nice idea, and that's it. Then in 2003, people from Australia, uh, Lyndon Weil and, and this guy, Huban, they proposed this evolution strategy with probability mutation, which uses a measure base also on the hypervolume to truncate the contents of the archive. So this is the same idea as Joshua Knowles proposed. Then in 2004, Eckhart Sisler publishes this paper in PPSN, very intriguing paper, in which he proposes the indicator-based evolutionary algorithm. This is more than an algorithm. It's, it's really like an algorithmic framework because you can incorporate, in theory, any performance indicator. And, and this, I have to tell you, I, I, I was not able to attend this conference in 2004. But uh, when I read the paper, I was really intrigued because I say, how come Eckhart Sisler is proposing to select solutions based on a performance indicator? In 2002, he published a paper in which he showed that most of the performance indicators were not reliable because they don't fulfill a property that is called Pareto compliance. This basically means these indicators are not compatible with the definition of Pareto optimality. So whatever they produce is not reliable. So how come the same guy who told us performance indicators are not reliable is now telling us, why don't you select using a performance indicator instead of using Pareto optimality? So at the beginning, I thought it was a joke. But then I realized, you know, Sisler, he's German. Germans don't joke. They don't even know how to joke. So this is, of course, not a joke. But he was referring to one particular indicator, not just any indicator. He was referring to the hyperbole. In the paper, he also uses the binary epsilon indicator, and we will talk about that one. But the hyperbole is the only unary indicator that we know that has the property of Pareto compliance. Actually, it's a very nice indicator because it has been proved mathematically that if you keep maximizing the hypervolume of a set, you will eventually converge to the true Pareto optimal set. So that means you don't need Pareto optimality. All you need to do is, given your solutions, always increase hypervolume. And if you keep doing that, you will eventually converge. So it's wonderful, right? So why is that not everybody uses the hypervolume? Because it's too expensive, incredibly expensive to compute the hypervolume in high dimensionality. But we will get to that. So Michael Emmerich, in, in 2005, another German, he proposed a variation of NSGA2 with a very long name, the S-metric selection evolutionary multi-objective algorithm. S-metric is another name given to the hypervolume. Uh, this is actually one of the most popular, perhaps the most popular, uh, indicator-based multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. This is more popular th than the indicator base from, from Sisler. So the way it works, this is also a steady state selection. That means you replace one solution at a time. So you have the population. It, at the beginning, it creates the, uh, it applies non-dominant sorting, same as the NSGA2. But once he has the layers in, in, uh, in the population, Instead of using the crowded comparison operator to, to generate the complete ordering of solutions, since we know the, uh, the crowded comparison operator doesn't scale, instead of that, they use hypervolume. Hypervolume does the same task. So given two solutions that are being compared, they compute, OK, if I keep this solution, what will be the hypervolume with respect to keeping this other solution? Whoever gives a higher value for the hypervolume, that's the solution you retain. The other one you get rid of. This, however, as I said, is, is very expensive in high dimensionality. When the approach was proposed, it was OK, because they only use this in two and three objectives. But as you increase the number of objectives, it gets really, really expensive. There was another version published in 2007, developed by Nicola Boyme. Uh, in which the algorithm is made more efficient by making some small changes in the selection mechanism. Uh, 
it is basically the same algorithm except that uh, in some cases they avoid using the hypervolume for uh, the density estimate. Something that is uh, important to remark about this algorithm, although this is called indicator-based selection, in this case the performance indicator is, using, is, is being used only for the density estimate, not for selecting solutions. So this algorithm is still an SGA2. You are using Pareto optimality. The difference is the density estimator is no longer crowding. It's now hyperbolic. But this is still considered indicator-based. So just to give you an idea, because when I say this is an expensive uh, algorithm, you perhaps have no idea how expensive this is. Yes? How to, how to calculate, how to compute? Ah, well, there are algorithms for that. We will get to that. Yeah, there are several algorithms. The people will be crazy with this. <laughs> uh, the, this algorithm, right now, the most efficient algorithm we have to compute the heart, the hypervolume, is an algorithm developed by some people in Australia. It was released in the year 2016. And this algorithm allows you to go as far as perhaps 10 of them. But when SMS in one was released in the year 2007, if you run the algorithm for a problem with five objectives, a single run of the algorithm will take about perhaps six hours. You went to, uh, to one more objective, it will be 24 hours. And after eight objectives, nobody there because it will require like one week to do a single one. So it's very, very expensive. The intriguing thing is that theoretically, the lower bound for computing the hypervolume is logarithmic. But most people today believe that this is not possible. It's not possible to design an algorithm that, that has a logarithmic complexity. But uh, there are many, uh, many variations on it. Many algorithms that have been proposed to make more efficient for example, to do it in parallel, in parallel. But it's still uh, a reason why it's not that popular as, as we wish. So there are others, for example, this, uh, uh, this algorithm, the covariance matrix adaptation evolution st strategy, is, is a very uh, interesting algorithm. It was developed by Niklaus Hansen, kind of a crazy guy. Uh, I, I cannot think of another word for a guy. Imagine a guy who goes to medical school, becomes a doctor, and after that he decides he wants to get a PhD in mathematics. got to be a crazy guy, right? Why would you go to medical school first? You can just go straight ahead to... It's totally unrelated, right? One thing with the other. Okay, he developed this algorithm several years ago, and, and this is considered one of the most powerful single objective optimizers that we have available. It's an evolution strategy, which is based on this uh, covariance matrix uh, adaptation. Uh, it's a mechanism that uses some uh, matrices to decide in which direction to move. It's pretty much a local search algorithm, but it's very powerful. The source code is available in MATLAB and in C. And Christian Nigel, in 2007, proposed a multi-objective extension of this algorithm in which he used hyperbolic. He also used crowding, but at the end he decided to adopt uh, hyperbolic. The main uh, uh, advantage of using uh, a multi-objective extension of this algorithm is that this algorithm is rotation invariant. So you can rotate the function and it will still work. Most evolutionary algorithms, if you rotate the function, they don't, they don't work anymore. You will have to do all the resetting of parameters and all that. And most operators, uh, don't work properly when you rotate the function. Yes. Getting just the uh, the inverse, one of them, because the operators are, are really not designed for those situations. They are designed for having this on the plane. Span was about the last thing that Cicler did. It's a, this is called the set preference algorithm for multi-objective optimization, and it's meant to be a generalization of the indicator base in which any sort of set preference relation, it doesn't have to be a performance indicator, could be used in the selection mechanism. But this 
to this approach, most people didn't really pay attention. Then there was HIPE. HIPE was also a, an interesting idea developed by a student, a PhD student that Sisler advised in, in ETH, uh, Johannes Bader. Johannes Bader developed this version of the, uh, uh, it's an indicator based evol multi objective evolutionary algorithm in which the hyper volume is estimated using Monte Carlo simulations. So the, the argument is, is, is quite interesting. They say, okay, when I'm comparing two solutions using the hyper volume, I'm not really interested in knowing the exact hypervolume value. All I want to know is if one solution contributes more than the other. That's all I need. So this I could estimate. So they proposed to use uh, these Monte Carlo simulations to, to do the, the estimate. However, although in the paper they, they solve problems with up to 50 objectives using hypervolume, in practice, because the source code is available, the algorithm is not very good. The performance degrades very, very quickly. It, it depends a lot on a parameter. It, it has a parameter with which you can tune uh, how much do you want to estimate. You can go from exact hypervolume to, to sort of a very loose approximation. So uh, using the parameters they report in the paper, the results are very, very bad with respect to any other indicator based multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. So let's talk a little bit about the hypervolume. The hypervolume is also called the S metric or the Levesque measure. So for a set of solutions, the hypervolume measures the size of the portion of objective space that is dominated by, by this set of solutions if we consider all of them. So it has, as I said, very nice mathematical properties because it has been proved that it's not only the only performance indicator that is known to be monotonic with respect to Pareto dominance, it has been proved that maximizing the hypervolume, we will eventually converge to the true Pareto uh, front. So, uh, yeah, this uh, was Mark Fleischer in 2003 who proved that given a finite search space and a reference point, maximizing the hypervolume is equivalent to obtaining the Pareto optimal set. So a bounded set that contains the maximum possible hypervolume value for a certain population size will only consist of Pareto optimal solutions. So, and there is also experimental evidence in that sense. So this is great, it's wonderful, it's, it's a great indicator. But uh, it has two, two problems. One is that the computation of the hypervolume depends on the reference point that we adopt. Uh, it has been shown through a series of uh, authors, uh, researchers, that depending on where you set this point, the results will be different. Ideally, the reference point should be the nadir point. But since in most cases we won't compute the nadir point, we try to estimate. So for example, Sitzler proposed to use the worst objective function values, values available in the population. However, this requires a scaling of the objectives. But it's okay, you, you can do it that way. In most of the benchmark problems, they report the reference points they use. So you can simply take those reference points. The problem is, is if you use this in a real world problem. But the main drawback is really the computational cost. The best known algorithms currently available to compute the hypervolume have a complexity that is polynomial on the number of points but this complexity grows exponentially with the number of objectives. So the problem is not the number of points. The problem is the number of objectives. If you want to use this with more than five, six objectives, it can become unaffordable. It just takes too long. So since we haven't been able to find any algorithm of polynomial complexity for computing the, the exact hypervolume, then some people came up with the hypothesis that this algorithm may not be at all possible. You know, it's like the smart guy hypothesis. If I cannot do it, nobody else can do it, right? So, however, the time lower bound for the complexity of the hypervolume is logarithmic. This is very intriguing. So theoretically, it's possible. It's just we haven't been able to find, and it doesn't look like we will find this algorithm, at least not in my lifetime. 
There are some recent theoretical results that strengthen the hypothesis. Uh, for example, Brinman and, and, and Tobias Friedrich, they proved that computing hypervolume is, is Sharpie complete. That means no polynomial complexity algorithm will exist. So apparently it's not possible, but still the bound is there. So the bound is very intriguing. So they, there are lots of uh, papers and code available on the hypervolume. These are just a few links. If you are interested in, in, in getting this, uh, these papers and these implementations. Now, the use of the hypervolume to select solutions is not completely straightforward. Just because you have the code to compute the hypervolume as a performance indicator, that doesn't mean you can immediately use this to select solutions. You, know, it, it, you have to do a few things. So the indicator operates on a set of solutions. And the selection considers only one solution at a time. So how do you do the, the, the match in here? So when using the hypervolume to select solutions, you need what we call in evolutionary computation a fitness assignment strategy. The most common has been to perform first a non-dominated sorting and then run the solutions so that you have the different fronts and run based on the hypervolume uh, loss that results from removing a particular solution. So the idea is, is actually quite simple. It's, it's just, as I said, it's, it's expensive. So this is my, my Pareto front, but now I have a series of points. This, this is my approximation. Let's say the true Pareto front is somewhere here. So I have an approximation. And I will have now two solutions that are competing. For example, these two. I have A and B. Given the whole Pareto front, to compute the hypervolume, you need a reference point. The reference point, as I said, should be ideally the nadir point, because you have to close inside a box the, uh, the hypervolume. So the notion of hypervolume is the larger it is with respect to the same reference point, the better it is because you are moving down, right? You are minimizing, so the farther down you get, the better the result will be. So, okay, I have two solutions. I really don't know which of these two solutions is better, but I want to compare them. But the hypervolume is computed for the whole set. So to select which one should I keep, A or B, what you do is you say, OK, I have the Pareto front like this. And now I'm going to compute the hypervolume without B, just with A. And you get a value. Then you, you say, OK, I will compute now hypervolume only with B and without A. And you get the value. Whoever gives a higher value, that's the one you keep. So what is uh, better, to keep A or to keep B? Whoever maximizes the hyperbole. So it's not difficult, but you have to do it many times. That's why it's so expensive. Because in theory, you should do this for every single solution. So uh, the, the hyperbole raised the question that if we could use indicator-based selection, an obvious question was, can we use something else, something that is not so expensive as the hyperbole? And, and I have to tell you, I raised this question some years ago, and, and I received a lot of criticism because they said, yeah, it, it's possible, but the other indicators are not Pareto compliant. At least we don't know any other that is Pareto compliant. I say, yeah, OK. But is really Pareto compliance a big drawback or not? Because nobody really bothered to try this. So some years ago, with Oliver Chutze, we proposed an indicator called delta p. This is a, a, very, uh, a very nice indicator. Delta p uh, is, is really like an average house or distance. It's a combination of two indicators, generational distance and inverted generational distance. And, and this is also a very, uh, a very funny story of the inverted generational distance. Generational distance was proposed by Bell Doysen in, in his PhD thesis. 
So basically, let's assume this is your approximation. And in here, these big dots are the true Pareto front. So generational distance, GD, is for each point in my approximation, I will find the point that is closest to it and compute the Euclidean distance. And I do that for every single point in my approximation with respect to the, this is the true Pareto front. And then I get an average of that. This is generational distance. So several years ago, we submitted a paper to a journal called Genetic Prime and Evolvable Machines in which we were using GD. But GD has many problems. For example, if I have few solutions in my approximation, but they are close from each other, then GD will give a very good value. The ideal value is zero. When it gives zero, it's because all the points are on the true Pareto flow. But the small values are, are what we are aiming for. But we knew there were strange cases. Like if, if you had very few points, it gave very good values because these points were close to, to the uh, true Pareto front. You know, they had a very close point to, to point to. So the reviewer, who I am very sure this guy was not a multi-objective guy, because apparently no multi-objective guy could see this, could see this, this issue, he raised a very reasonable comment. He said, OK, if you are saying that GD has so many problems when measuring the distances from the approximation towards the true Pareto front, why don't you do it the other way around? Why don't you measure from the true Pareto front towards the approximation? And I thought, you know, this is real genius. Because it's true. If you do it in the opposite way, for example, this problem goes away. This will give you a very bad value. And, and the other way of measuring this is called inverted generational distance. And we are given credit as the inventors of this indicator, but it was really the reviewer. It's just, you know, it's an anonymous reviewer. God knows who this guy is. But uh, he's the one who gave us the, uh, the idea. And this is now one of the most popular indicators because it has some really nice properties. It's not Pareto compliant. That's not. But it measures not, not only convergence, but also a spread of solutions. We will get to this because we will talk a lot about uh, performance indicators. Yes. Sir, when you say two uh, do you mean uh, this is the set of non set, uh, which have uh, best spread of solutions? Georgia, yeah. that you obtain by brute force or by the linear means. That means that this set has the best spread of solutions. Yeah. So this indicator assumes you already know. You don't have this kind of thing. Yes. Some cases in which it doesn't work. 
for example, in multifrontal problems, if you have several faults by the fronts, it's not supposed to work. But the computational cost of this indicator is, is very low, which is nice. And uh, the only catch here is if you want to use delta p to select solutions, since normally we don't have the true Pareto optimal front, we need to have a reference set. This reference set is, is very, uh, very important, this approximation of the true Pareto front. There are some tricks to, to build this, but it is in general, it's complicated. So there have been some proposals. Oliver did something with his uh, German friends. Uh, but uh, these two proposals, they are not scalable. They, they, they really uh, are designed for low dimensionality, for only two or three objectives. We propose one based on differential evolution. This one is scalable to any number of objectives. Uh, and it builds the, uh, the reference set in sort of a very clever way. But uh, again, not many people like this, this algorithm for, for whatever reason. It's probably because of the indicator. Then there is another interesting indicator, R2. R2 belongs to the family of the R indicators. Uh, uh, we are going to talk about that as well. Uh, the R2 indicator has some really nice properties, very similar to the hypervolume. Not as good as the hypervolume, but second best, we can say. And R2 uh, is not that difficult to adopt for uh, designing a selection mechanism. However, the big difference here with respect to hypervolume is that algorithms based on R2 have to be based on decomposition because this uh, indicator is really taught for single objective uh, optimization. It's a utility function. So this is the definition of R2. Uh, so R2 is weakly monotonic. It's correlated to the hypervolume, but its computational cost is considerably lower. So it's recommended for, uh, for many objective problems. And of course, there are some issues, as, as normally happens in these cases. This U is a set of utility functions. So there are some alternatives. For example, a weighted Chebyshev or an augmented Chebyshev function can be used. But uh, this is not a big deal. It's, it's not that difficult to come up with, with some utility function. So we developed uh, an approach based on R2 some years ago in 2013. Uh, Demo also proposed one. Uh, and uh, there were, I was also involved in the development with Gregorio of another, another algorithm. And there are about two more. This one is is very nice based on the indicator base, evolutionary algorithm. And a more recent one from uh, Raquel is a PhD student of mine who is about to graduate. She developed one that is, this one is very powerful. OK, so the last algorithm that we will see uh, is NSGA3, which was proposed in 2014. And it's basically an extension of NSGA2 designed to deal with many objective problems. Many objective problems, as I mentioned before, are problems having four or more objectives. It still uses non-dominated sorting, but in this case, it also uses decomposition, same as Moia D, and it uses reference points. These reference points have to be well spread, so the, the paper provides a, a methodology to compute the reference points. So this can be seen as a hybrid between NSGA2 and Moia D, these, these two uh, famous and well-known uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. There are many others. I, I already mentioned the ones that people don't use. So NSGA2, as I said before, the, the source code is not available from the authors of the algorithm, but there are implementations in the public domain. There is one that many people have used from Taiwan. A guy from Taiwan developed one. And J Metal now has one based on, on, on this one uh, available in the public domain. And it's very interesting because I have seen at, at conferences in the last two years several papers in which they present improved versions of NSGA3. How can you improve an algorithm you don't have, right? <laughs> they are improving an implementation that nobody knows if it's correct. And actually, I have heard Kaljamoedeb complaining, saying, all these implementations are wrong. 
And I told him, why don't you just shut up? You know, they are improving on the thing. So they will eventually converge to the original implementation or something better, right? So no need to worry about this. This paper was actually published in two parts, but uh, the second part is, is uh, more on constraints. So the algorithm itself is, is in the first part. That's why uh, this is the, uh, the paper that is most highly cited. Actually, I had to handle this paper in the transactions. And, and it was a nightmare because they wanted to reject one part and to accept the other, which would have been a disaster. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, to assess like, multiple parameters, mm -hmm. we uh, usually look at the spacing between the solutions and the diversity of the solutions. So this hypervolume indicator is a, like, it's a level indicator just can it replace the spacing? I yeah, it's not a problem, but it's not a problem because you, you just keep maximizing. When I say uh, multiple Pareto problems, what I mean is there are, these are, of course, artificial problems. There are problems in which you will find regions of sensor space that look like the Pareto But none of these is the two Pareto The two Pareto problems is here. So if your algorithm is not very good, it's going to uh, get trapped here because it will find many solutions. And the algorithm will assume that's it. You know, I already found the Pareto problem. Yeah. But if you keep moving, you will find another and another and another, and you eventually get to the Pareto But like if I have two different approximations of the two Pareto if I run, for example, NSG2 for two computations, that's I will have two different approximations. For Not me. necessarily. NSG2 is able to solve some of these multiple problems. Others nobody can solve. But you see, we will see test problems. I will show you problems like this in the test problems. In a test problem, one of the rules is it's not supposed to be trivial, right? It has to be difficult. But if the test problem is too difficult, it's not fun anymore because nobody can solve it. <laughs> so you have to produce something in between. So multifrontality at the beginning was considered to be very challenging. For the algorithms we had back in the year 2000, 2001, multifrontality was very challenging. Today, it's not, it's not that difficult. There are other sources of it. Multifrontality is not a big deal. It's just the indicator I mentioned, delta P, has problems with multifrontality. Because the reference set is not reliable. Because remember, you are approximating the true particle of the form. So if you are using false information, the information from this data, thinking that this is the true particle form, then the, the, the selection will be biased. So that's really the source of it. There is a way around that. But I'm not going to tell you. Then we are going to publish this before me. <laughs> Good. Sir, when we are using uh, these indicators to get the uh, uh, quality of the solution, can we use these indicators to show the convergence uh, speed of an operation as well? Convergence speed, that's very challenging. I haven't seen anybody who has been able to, uh, to, to prove convergence speed of another and to get the one thing is to prove that it will converge. But to tell me how fast it will converge is very difficult. In theory, you could use an indicator, but uh, the way the, the most common mechanism has been through the uh, external archive. With the external archive, you can prove convergence. Still, the speed of convergence is another thing. That's a much more complicated. Because normally, if, for example, in single objective optimization, there are bounds. But the bounds are so big, you could fit the whole universe in it. It is like, it's going to converge before you know, the, the universe collapses. Because it gives you a double exponential. <laughs> so it's of no use at all. It's, it's difficult to get that. In multi-objective, I haven't seen any value of convergence. We cannot uh, show the convergence speed, but uh, we can uh, show the uh, convergence of an approach by plotting the actually Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, sir, uh, for quality uh, objective optimization problem, which uh, indicator is suggestible to you? Would you suggest to show the convergence? The hyperloop. It's the only one that is perfect. <laughs> so, anything else you plot is not reliable. And the one you plot is not reliable, you have to be happy. <laughs> there are not that many choices, only one. But so, sir, Kalamadam has uh, 
argumented that hypervolume alone should not be taken as a performance indicator in this book. That is my question goes to your view. Oh, no, no. As, it is different. As a performance indicator, it's OK. I was saying it's too expensive as a selection mechanism. Okay. Because as a performance indicator, you produce your approximation, and you compute only once. You have to. So let's say it takes one hour. In one hour, you can afford. If you have 10 objectives. You have five, it will be second. So as a performance indicator, is, is great. But it's very different to use it to select solutions. Select solutions is not affordable. It's not we don't want to use it. It's, it's just we cannot afford it. That's really the problem. OK, this is a, a, a graph I always put when I give talks on evolution of objective optimization. Here you can see years of publication and uh, number of papers. So this is taken from the EMO repository. I will give you the, the reference, but that's the place where I entered yesterday. Uh, and it's very interesting because for me, you know, I, as I told you before, I was lucky to, to be uh, part of this history of EMO. It tells me many things. So you can see here, according to this plot, the whole thing started in 1984. It's only one publication. That publication is the PhD thesis of John David Chess. Then in 85, they changed to publish two papers, one in ICTA and another one in a conference on, on machine learning. Then in 86, nothing happened. 87, 88, there is one paper over there. So basically, nothing was happening until the 90s. In the 90s, Carlos Fonseca starts working on, on more. 95. Carlos Fonseca publishes the first super in the world. At that time, he had to read about <coughs> 50 papers to, to write that super. 99, I published the second super. I had to read about 100 papers. I got my PhD in 96. My PhD thesis is probably number three in the area. There are some really obscure pieces. I have them all. From, uh, Brooklyn College or whatever. You know, some guys I've never heard in my life. They never publish anything in an evolution rotation in a conference. But these pieces are a multi-objective organization. So one day, you know, I went to bed. Next day, I wake up. And everybody was doing evolution and multi-objective things. What is going on here? So you can see here this bar. Here, what is this? 2009. More than 1,000 publications in one year. One so some people ask me, so is there now a decline on the number of papers on evolution and multi-objective optimization as these bars are smaller after year 2009? And the answer is no, of course there is no decline. It's just I don't have enough time to ask it. That's the, uh, the reason why you see less uh, publications in this bar. My assistant has to do this, but still I don't have probably too much to I don't know why I'm this. But uh, this is still very hot. It's, a, it's an area in which many people are publishing. And, and it became a phenomenon out of nowhere. People got interested in it and they started to do it. Of course, most people do applications. They, they, they don't do other, they don't do performance indicators, they don't do terror. Most of these papers are applications. This is another one that is very interesting. It's in my book, in the second edition number of objectives that people use in their papers. We took a sample from the repository and analyzed how many objectives they were using back in 2007. So most people were using only two objectives. A few went to three, four, five. But look at this, 500. That's really insane, right, to use 500 objectives. Some friends of mine didn't believe me this. But then in Daxtool, we met this Japanese guy. He claimed he solved a problem with 300 objectives, a, a real world problem. This one is very funny, because this paper was written by a French guy who solved uh, a problem of coordination of robots in which each of the robots was considered as an objective. And he used a linear aggregating function. So you can imagine, if you are adding up, 500 weights, and the ad has to be one. My guess is using a, a random uh, procedure will, will produce the same results. I don't think the linear aggregating function has any effect here. 
So anything above seven is considered by many as difficult for the decision maker to conceive. But in the real world, there are problems with more than seven objectives. Why is seven so you know, important or so significant? You are probably aware that there was this famous study, I think it was in the 50s, a professor at Harvard University, he conducted a study on the short-term memory of Americans. And, and he determined that the, what he called the magical number was seven. Seven plus minus two. What does that mean? He said, okay, running a statistics on, on, I don't know, thousands of people he analyzed. People on average can remember seven things. It's plus minus because there are some guys who can only remember five and a few who can do nine. So why is this number so important? If you think of phone numbers in the US, phone numbers, area code was created because of this number. Phone numbers have seven digits in the US. And then area code has three more. So if you separate a 10-digit number in two parts, people can remember. But if the whole number was 10 digits, nobody could remember the number. So very clever, right? So the seven is not out of chance. When you write a program, you're not supposed to put more than seven parameters because the user won't be able to remember. Of course, there are people, you know, they have elephant memory or whatever. They can remember 20 parameters. But these guys are freaks, right? They are not average. So average people can only remember seven things. So going more than seven for many people is challenging because they say our brain cannot really process this. I'm not so sure because, you know, I, I have seen people like, uh, like my wife is watching a soap opera, is cooking, talking to the children, and talking to me at the same time. And she seems to, to grasp everything. So say, what the hell is going on here? You know, this is very scary. But, but these brains, they were different. You know? Male friends are very simple. We are only thinking on food, on one thing at a time. No overlaps, because our brain is not designed for that. It was designed for something else. So uh, we don't understand you know, these this, uh, multitasking skills of female brains. But uh, seven, as I said, is, is critical for many things, but not for design. For design, it's possible, because many problems may have conceptually many objectives. Of course, as you increase the number of objectives, it will happen that some of them are not really objectives. You may think they are, but they are not. And when you do the optimization, you will realize that. But in any case, today, people are, are going crazy trying to solve problems with 10, 15, 20. Normally, the maximum is around 30 or 50 objectives. OK. So the topic we are going to see now is diversity. Diversity is, is very important in evolutionary computation in general, but we will talk about diversity more in the context of uh, evolutionary computation, of uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithms, I'm sorry. Diversity is important because if you keep in mind that we are trying to model, uh, to simulate uh, something that happens in nature, in nature, diversity is key to preserve a species. If we lose diversity as a species, then many bad things happen. There is evidence, for example, of uh, people who live uh, in, uh, in these very isolated areas in which they end up recombining with each other, few families, and they are all relatives. So they lose genetic diversity. And this produces many diseases. They, there may be even an, a local extinction. As, as a group, they may disappear. Because diversity is, is important in nature. In our simulation, it's also important because we have always a stochastic noise, as I mentioned yesterday, because of the pseudo-random numbers that we use with the computer. There are some phenomena that have been studied. This occurs in nature, but also occurs in the simulation. For example, the so-called genetic drift. Genetic drift basically relates to the loss of diversity. Genetic drift in nature, what happens is, the definition is genetic drift occurs when your genes are selected not based on your skills, but 
randomly. You know, like nature doesn't care anymore. Then your evolution is basically drifting away, right? You, you don't have anything guiding your evolution as, as a species. And this, of course, will lead to extinction. It's, it's something really bad. This is like reproduction. Any species, if, if any species loses its capability to reproduce, it, it will disappear. So reproduction is, is, is very important. So genetic grief is something that has been studied for a long time. And of course, the old man, John Holland, was one of the first to, to look into this issue. He proposed an operator called crowding, which is in his book, the one that nobody reads, that uh, consists in identifying situations in which more individuals dominate a, a particular ecological niche and uh, tries to, uh, to increase diversity in those cases. Not to, you should not confuse this crowding with NSGA 2's crowd. This is different. This is the original one, the original one from Holland. It's, it's a very old idea, very old concept that tries basically to increase um, diversity, modeling an ecological niche. In nature, this is really what happens, that we normally have in any ecological niche a limited amount of resources. So because of that, there is a competition for resources. Uh, some years ago, there were many movies, many science fiction movies that depicted that in the future we will be fighting over oil. Today, many people believe the next war will be created not by oil, but by water. Water will be the big issue because we are running out of drinkable water in the planet. So at some point, this is going to be a big problem. And, and we may have to fight over this. So resources are always limited. And, and of course, if we have very limited resources, the capability of a certain species to survive is conditioned to many things related to these resources. Like, for example, we have to compete physically. We have to fight with somebody else. If we are strong, we have a higher probability of surviving. We are not strong our probability of surviving is lower. So uh, Ken De Jong, in his uh, PhD thesis from 1975, experimented with this crowding operator from John Holland. He used a non-generational genetic algorithm in which a fraction of the population was selected using proportional selection. And, and he had a parameter, this GG, the generational gap. Uh, and this population that he selected, this portion, was subject to crossover and mutation. And after applying crossover and mutation, he used this, this value to select more solutions in the population that will die. So these individuals, let's say if GG was two, will replace the, uh, the individual that died, the new, the new ones produced by crossover and mutation will replace the ones in the uh, original in the population. And this, uh, the idea here was, if I replace these individuals, normally these were individuals with a low fitness value, the ones to be replaced. I'm increasing diversity because I'm avoiding individuals of low fitness to, to stay a long time in the population. So it was a, an interesting idea. This is 1975, of course. None of these studies have been conducted ever. Uh, then each offspring will find the individual that will replace by taking a random sample. There is another parameter here, the crowding factor. So they take a sample of this size. And each offspring replaces the individual which is most similar to it. Similarity you can measure. Uh, using a Hamming distance, because all this was done in binary, with binary encoding. Uh, you can do this in several ways. So if you use CF1, this means no crowding will take place. And as you increase CF, it's more likely than similar individuals are going to be replaced among themselves. So as I said, Hamming distance is, is used in this case for the genotypes. The genotype is the binary string. In a genetic algorithm, we use binary numbers to encode solutions of any sort in the original genetic algorithm. Then we have Cavicio. Uh, Cavicio proposed in 1970 in his PhD thesis several preselection schemes 
from which one was oriented to preserve diversity. So the idea here was that if an offspring had a higher fitness than the worst parent, then this offspring will replace the worst parent. It's a very, very simple idea, but this was a PhD thesis from 1970. That's a long, long time ago. You weren't born yet at that time. Then is fitness sharing. We, we talked a little bit about fitness sharing yesterday. It was proposed by David Goldberg and, and this guy Richardson in 1987. In this case, I already explained the subpopulation. The population is divided into several subpopulations uh, using a parameter sigma share, which is the niche radius. And this can be done in phenotypic or genotypic, genotypic space. This means the space of the parameters when they are already decoded. That means you went from binary to the alphabet you are using. For example, you are using real numbers for your decision variables, but you encode the decision variables as, as binary numbers. So the decoded parameters will be the real numbers. And the encoded parameters will be binary. So you can do it in any of these two spaces or also in objective function space. We saw yesterday this, this expression and, and the way in which this value affects the original uh, objective or fitness function value. Carl Yamoidev, in his master's thesis, he proposed a methodology to compute sigma share. In, in phenotypic space, he adopts an Euclidean distance in a p-dimensional space. In this case, p refers to the number of decision variables that are encoded in the evolutionary algorithm. This is also a very famous paper. So he uses this expression, this d, these distances, which is just Euclidean distances. And these x's in here are the decoded variables. And to estimate sigma share, he uses this expression. R is all this expression from here. P and Q are parameters. P is uh, the number of dimensions you have. And Q is the number of niches you, that you want to have. So you still need to know how many niches you will have in the population. In, in the other one, genotypic uh, fitness sharing, the distance is defined as the Hamming distance between the strings. And then sigma share is the maximum number of different bits that are allowed between strings to, to form separate niches. So there is a different expression. This is the expression. In here, L is the length of the string. K is the maximum difference. This is a parameter you have to give. And, and, uh, and Q, again, is the number of subdivisions or the number of niches that you need. So sigma share will be equals to K in this case. For large values of L, they suggest to use this expression where set star is the normalized difference that corresponds to, to 1 over Q of the total probability space. So it's, uh, it can be obtained from a cumulative normal distribution. So this expression nobody ever used in multimodal. This was not for multi-objective, it was for multimodal optimization. But just to sh show you that there was a lot of work done in the 80s about fitness sharing. Uh, they show in this paper from 89 that fitness sharing was better than crowding. And it worked better in phenotypic space than in genotypic space. So those were the findings at that time. Something more related to multi-objective is, is the work by Carlos Fonseca. He, he proposed uh, an expression to compute sigma share. Basically, you have to obtain sigma share from here. Everything else is known in this expression. N is the population size. This uh, delta i is the difference between the maximum and minimum objective function value. So this we can know. And, and this k is the number of objectives. So this we also know. So this is just multiplication. So you can develop this expression and obtain sigma share from there. You can uh, uh, derive it from the difference between the maximum and minimum objective function values. So it's not, uh, it's not difficult to, to do that. And this works very nicely. This is the approach he used in, in MOGA. So should we have a break? Okay.